our final yes, talk of the day. Um, it is uh, it is my, my my great privilege to introduce Corinne Oberg. Um, Corinne, not being able to make up her mind, received a bachelor's in chemistry from Caltech in 2005, and then a doctor in astronomy from Leiden University in the Netherlands in 2009 and continuing to refuse to be forced to decide has become a leading scholar in astrochemistry. Who knew? Uh, which offers amazing insights into planetary formation and particularly the, the recent exoplanet discoveries. Continuing to toe the line, she did a postdoc at the Harvard Smithsonian, Cent uh, Harvard, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, then became a professor of chemistry and astronomy at the University of Virginia, and then a professor of astronomy at Harvard. Although, I have it on good authority that she demanded they build her a chemistry lab in the start of her. <laughs> she has received numerous accolades and awards since the time she was still in secondary school in her native Sweden. Most recently, the, the Newton Lacey Pierce Award in 2016 for her outstanding achievement, for which is an award for outstanding achievement in observational astronomy by a young scholar. Uh, and this is perhaps inspired by her group's discovery of the first complex organic molecules in a protoplanetary disk. Um, I'm going to claim I know what that means. Uh, <laughs> um, two particles. Um, in the line of being young and outstanding, it is a source of some embarrassment, but mostly pride, uh, that despite being a year behind me at Caltech, she managed to both get tenure at Harvard and marry an amazing Italian guy before I even finished school. <laughs> As amazing as her scientific accomplishments are, and I would argue even more so, is her journey to the Catholic faith uh, and the amazing energy with which she has been willing to engage discussions in faith and science in what many would consider harsh environments. Uh, in, in particular, she is one of the founding members of the Society of Catholic Scientists, who I've been told I need to plug. Now, the Society of Catholic Scientists is relatively new. If you're not familiar with it, it was founded a year and a half, two years ago? Jobs, uh, there we go. Um, and it is a, a fellowship organization for Catholics who are in the sciences, which many of you are. Um, there are student memberships, and it would be, and, and, and you are encouraged to look into this. Uh, I had a chance to go to the first annual conference last year in Chicago. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful experience to be among really good scientists who are also just serious about their faith and to be able to share and interact with them. It's a, it's a wonderful fellowship experience. It's also just, I learned a lot of science and, and, and made a lot of really great friends. Uh, and so I strongly encourage you, if you have not, to, to, to go to catholicscientist.org uh, and uh, to, to, to sign up. If you need any more convincing, we have several of the board members of the Society of Catholic Scientists here, including Corinne Oberg and, of course, the founder, Stephen Barr. One of the founders. One of the founders. I, was also a I had a conversation with him about this like six years ago, so trust me, he's... <laughs> no. um, uh, Jonathan Lunai, uh, uh, and, and uh, Stephen Meredith, uh, and then Nic Nic uh, Nicanor Ostriaco, a Dominican, who will be here at some point, I think. Um, so, if you get a chance to... Who's here? No, no, we're speaking here. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, so I think that's everybody who's here. But it's this great organization, I encourage you to, to look into it, to apply to become members, and, and to take part in that fraternity. Um, finally, uh, getting back to Craig. It is another source of pride that she has become such an avid Dominican group, particularly <laughs> a, great, a great lover of St. Catherine of Siena, because that means I can stretch things and add her to the list of five, the, 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 the fifth member of the group of recent Caltech graduates who have become Dominicans, at least at least in spirit in Corinne's case, but a little more, a bit more practically in my case, in fact, another one here, uh, Sister Albertine. Um, just weird fact. Um, <laughs> with that, it is my great honor and privilege to introduce Corinne Gilbert, who will be speaking to us on exoplanets and extraterrestrials and theology. Father Thomas for that wonderful introduction. And despite Steve's modesty, I would say that though on paper we're all, you know, equal co-founders, there's definitely one of us who did like 90% of the work. So we're uh, all open uh, great debt of gratitude. So 
I admit that I was a bit too much of a coward to come to the House of Studies and talk about Thomistic philosophy. So there won't be that much of it in the talk, though Thomas will, of course, make an appearance here and there. It's impossible to, to completely avoid it. And instead, I will take my starting point in something I feel more comfortable in talking about, which is the science of exoplanets. And trying to assess the likelihood of finding life or where to where to look for extraterrestrial life. And what is amazing is that we live in an age where we are seeing plants from other stars that just nobody's business. And this, uh, of course, makes it possible to not think about which ones, if any of these planets, that might be inhabited. And it's very nice for someone who has who is indeed not just a group of the Dominican order, which I am, uh, but also have been interested in philosophy and theology long, long before I was, I was a Catholic. The, the topics that I have chosen, or maybe have chosen me, uh, providentially do, I think, demand that we ask also some sometimes tough uh, metaphysical and theological questions. So I'll try to tie that where it makes sense in this presentation. But let's start where, with the first word of this talk, so exoplanets. So in the past couple of decades, something really amazing uh, has happened, which is that when we used to look up uh, on, the, on the star sky, it's one of um, many beautiful pictures, and this will be a pretty visual presentation, so if you're sitting in the back, you sometimes want to move to the front, you know, that's, that's totally okay. Uh, but what's happened is that we used to look up to this beautiful, but somewhat cold and, and distant staring uh, star sky and starting about two decades ago and continuing right now this sky has become alive that almost every one of these stars harbor at least one planet around them so each of these stars they're not just stars they are stellar systems there are worlds on their own so we have we have these exoplanets uh, that the science uh, of these exoplanets is something I want to tell you about where we stand, what we know, what we don't know. Uh, where the field is going uh, is, of course, trying to figure out what these planets are like, and especially if any of them are inhabited. The direct way that astronomers think about this is they turn their telescopes towards some of these discovered planets, and then look at the atmospheres, which is what, what is accessible to us uh, with telescopes and see if there are signatures of life uh, in those atmospheres. This is, however, really, really hard to do, and we are not there yet. So another uh, avenue of inquiry that has gained a lot of traction is thinking about um, how life could possibly originate here on Earth and on other planets, and whether there are specific characteristics in plants we could look for that would would, that would then be with a high probability would be inhabited. So this is going to be sort of the, the science, the science content of, of this presentation. Uh, but of course, we're not here just to talk science, but also on how philosophy, theology, and science uh, tie together. So, so what is the significance from sort of metaphysical and theological point of view of these discoveries and some of these potential uh, future discoveries? Well, I would say they come in a few different flavors. Uh, with, as I hinted at in the second slide, or when I was showing that the star sky does now become a planetary sky, uh, I would claim there are some cosmological changes. It has been a cosmological shift. Uh, and as we've already heard some, and I will talk some more about, cosmology and metaphysics and theology, there are ties between that uh, should not uh, be ignored and historically have, have played uh, a, large, a large role. Uh, the second one has to do with the potential of these planets being living systems. Uh, that ties in with how we think about creation and therefore uh, about the, the creator. I say the third one is probably one where if any words or contro real controversy is going to enter in, is if any of these systems are just not inhabited by some life, but is inhabited by intelligent or rational animals. 
And as, as if that there, that's where we enter into territory where these some Christians get very nervous. And we will talk about some of these anxieties and how well-founded they are, and if there are also, but I think some real sort of theological excitements uh, that can be gained from, from such an encounter. So let's start with, with the first one, so cosmology. So why, why would we possibly think that cosmology would matter for, for theology or religion? Well, um, we've already heard some of it, so I'm just going to show my own favorite pictures that illustrate that there is a, a very clear connection. If you go back to the mythological religion, so this is a recreation of the Babylonian night sky. Um, so the different mythological creatures that made up the, the stellar constellations. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear that there is a direct link here between the worship, uh, worship of the mythological nature uh, and of the nature of the cosmos itself. Uh, this is very different from the cosmos that we would associate with the Hebrews, uh, where you do have something that first looks very different compared to what we think of today, but it's not the mythological cosmos anymore. It is one that is ordered uh, by God, where there is an abyss between the creator and the creation. Uh, this co cosmos, was uh, replaced in, in the West uh, by that of Aristotle, which pervaded, as we just heard, throughout the medieval times. Uh, this, again, is very different from the previous uh, cosmologies. Here we have something where uh, it's extremely well-ordered, that if you want to understand and create what the creator is in this cosmos, it is someone who, if this word could be eternal, for sure, I mean, that was what Aristotle believed, even if the Vedivials uh, did not, based on Revelation. And it's one where it makes perfect sense to ask why something falls to the ground, for example. Uh, this, as we know, this, uh, during one of the, I guess, more difficult uh, science-religion conversations in the church history, this, this cosmos was also replaced by the mechanistic one uh, from the enlightenment uh, science. Uh, another cosmos that uh, seems to work sometimes better with an eternal world than the one that was uh, created in time. Uh, a cosmos where you can conceive of a creator that is of the deist kind, that sets the world in motion and then lets go of it. There's no intuition here uh, as I think there is actually in modern cosmology, that you need an, an act of God, even though I would argue that just because you don't have a beginning, of course, doesn't mean that you need someone, don't need someone to sustain the cosmos. Now, as we already talked about, there's no reason God could not have created a cosmos that fit with any of these images that have been had throughout history. I find it extremely providential that it seems that he created something very different, which is the cosmology that we now think of as a very a good description of the world we live in. So that would be a cosmos that started out very, very small, uh, that has evolved over billions of years into something that's very different from how it started out, uh, that is very, very big, uh, whether it, it is finite or infinite in size, we don't know. Uh, so why would I say that this is, seems providential, that this is the cosmos we inhabit? Well, it is a cosmos, I think, that seems fitting with how we think about God, that seems like a suitable icon uh, of the God we worship. When we think about uh, a God that is beyond the, the universe that is eternal himself, having uh, a universe that we cannot tell whether it is infinite or finite, seems like a, a, a beautiful, suitable icon. This is also a universe that has this very beautiful and strange dignity to it, if you think about it, which I would say there's an analogy here between a universe that gets to be part of, uh, taking part in its own uh, not just in its own creation from nothing, but in its own development, development of new structures. There, so there's some analogy there between 
doing creatures such as herself a free will, but there is a strange and beautiful dignity that our creator has given to the universe. Now, this kind of unfolding and emerging cosmos, we, uh, we see, of course, on this grand scale, on a cosmological scale, uh, but it's also something that we see on other scales. So, as Father Thomas mentioned, uh, my expertise is in thinking about plant formation and star formation. So I put that here, the life cycle of star plant formation. We'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, but stars are forming and stars are dying. Uh, in our galaxy alone, seven new stars form every year, which is one of my favorite uh, sort of fun facts. Uh, this is a cosmos that on all levels is um, is evolving, is developing new patterns, new complexities. Of course, in biology, we see something different, something similar, uh, which is one of the great discoveries of the 19th century. So, in all this, uh, I say there is, there is, of course, a, a general sense in which uh, creation reveals uh, the creator. Uh, if there is. Um, if you go back, as Thomas and Thomas would make one or two appearances, I think this would be a suitable place to, to remind ourselves on, on his uh, teaching of why there are many beings instead of one kind of a being. Uh, that this seems to fit very well with the, the cosmos that we are inhabited, but there are sort of new beings, new structures that are popping up at the fairly regular, uh, regular intervals. And I think the beauty of it is that while so far they do fit into the physics of chemistry, which you can develop the physics of chemistry and biology to explain the new structures, the new kind of creatures that we see, they're also surprising. I mean, the, it makes perfect sense, and we understand somehow planets form around stars, but if you asked sort of astronomers 20 years ago what, that we would know that every star is a planetary system, um, I don't know, remember a textbook that claimed that. I mean, so it has this combined meaning of surprise uh, and at the same time coherence and like low abiding structures, which I think says something about sort of the creative personality uh, of the God we worship. And I think keeping that as an icon in the back of our heads, I think, is useful. Now, the final thing is that I would have Potential, there's potential to be some controversy is when we're starting to think about life on other planets. Uh, I think it would be absolutely wonderful to find any kind of life anywhere outside uh, of Earth. And uh, that alone, I think, when we're talking about God as a creator, it's going to be, I think we're going to think about God somewhat differently if we either find that the universe is teeming with life or that it's actually quite desolate in some sense, that we are sort of the one place that we end up knowing about for, that is a living system. But where there is some potential for trouble uh, is uh, when it comes to extraterrestrial intelligent life. Uh, also, there are two concerns that are brought up, either from sort of atheist or the Christian in the corners. Uh, the one that you most often, I think, hear in the debate from the, the new atheists is that, first of all, they seem to all take for granted that obviously extraterrestrial life exists, which we'll, we'll talk about how, how certain we can actually be about that. But then, because obviously extraterrestrial life exists, uh, we are not that special. So for us to claim that we have a special relationship with God seems silly. So that would be the first of concern that it, in some one way or another threatens the, the specialness of our relationship with God, which is, seems to be re is revealed to us. Uh, the other one is that these extraterrestrial intelligent life, they're, they're sort of existence, or at least their existence under certain conditions uh, could be in conflict with teachings either from scripture or from church authority. So we'll revisit those uh, towards the end of the talk with some um, not really my own original speculations, because I've taken them all from a book, which I will recommend to you, uh, of the woman, woman Marie <coughs> George, that I can kind of recommend. But I'll come back to that. So with those, the, those sort of reasons for such as why you should care about the science, whether or not you find it fascinating, though I don't understand how you cannot find it fascinating, <laughs> but 
there are planets around other stars that are potentially inhabited. But if you don't, then there are still reasons from sort of metaphysical and theological point of view that these are good things to, to know about and, and keep in mind um, as we continue to develop metaphysical and theological concepts. So exoplanets. Um, how do we know? I just said that basically every star has a planet. So how do we know that? The most obvious way you could think of, of detecting a planet uh, would be to do what we do in our own solar system, which is just to look for them. So this is obviously not what the ancients saw when they looked up at the sky. They saw it as little moving dots uh, uh, along, along the heavens. This is a modern uh, picture of Saturn taken with a Hubble uh, telescope. But yet still, it's the same, same deal. You look for light, reflected light, uh, so planets reflect light from the sun. You look for this reflected light, and when you see it, you see the planet. We have been able to do this in a few special cases for planets around other stars. And the most famous one is the one shown here, which is HR H799. All these planets tend to have this kind of phone number names. Uh, but this one, most of the stars know of because it is such a beautiful system. So it's a star that's surrounded by four planets. Each of the planets are bigger than Jupiter. That is the reason we can see them. Uh, and what's amazing is that this one has been known for quite some time. It's been known for about a decade. And astronomers have gone back and observed it every year for about a decade. And because of that, I can show you this, which is the planet, the four planets orbiting the star. So it's super cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for acknowledging that. <laughs> the reason that there's this um, black sort of circle at the center is that to do this, you have to block out the light from the central star, or that light would just totally uh, outshine and like to see from the planets. However, the number of systems where we can do this is on the order of 10. You really need very big planets, you need them to be far away from the star to apply this technique. You're not going to find what you would think of as Earth-like planets uh, using this technique. Instead, the most common technique to find new planets is the so-called transit technique. So here's another video just showing what it is, because here, trick is that you don't need to resolve the system, so we're not going to see it like this, but you'll see in the corner, you'll see the, the light curve from the star, no, so you can actually start this, and I'm going to try not to. Okay, never mind, apparently having one video working, it's was like, it's no, it's kind of awesome, just, just not on my screen. <laughs> okay, so you see the light curve, or look over here instead. So that would be the light that we observe from the star. So we, we, we observe the star continuously. As the planet passes in front, we'll see a small dip from, from the planet. Obviously, we can't do this for most planetary systems because you need the planet, the star, to be aligned with us to be able to do this. We can do it for enough. And we have done it for about 4,000. We've seen this now happening for about three, 4,000 stars where we have seen this dip to the planet. And based on that, and based on assuming that we have sort of random uh, inclination of the star, planet, and us, uh, that's where we get this number from, that almost every star uh, must have a planet or several planets around them. But it's not the only thing we can learn from these so-called transit curves. So it's just an illustration of the, the movie you just saw. Uh, when we look at how much light this is dimmed out, we can say how big the planet is. So it's a bigger planet costs a bigger shadow. Uh, when we look at the length uh, of this transit and uh, just the duration of the orbit, so how long it takes until you have another uh, transit event, uh, we can tell how far away from the from the star the planet is. Uh, Kepler. Uh, came up the Kepler's laws. One of Kepler's laws from the 17th century uh, relates uh, how far away a planet is to how long it takes to, to orbit a star if you know the mass of the central star. And we can use that to just tell where the planet is. Um, that, that's going to be really important when we think about what kind of planets could possibly sustain, sustain life, as I'll come back to you in a minute. But based on these transit discovery, the transit detections, uh, as I said, we have detected thousands of exoplanets. 
And one of the great, because I'm supposed to surprises, but maybe shouldn't have been surprised, is that planets come in many different flavors. So these are artists and impressions, but it's just trying to make the point that we see planets of all sizes. Uh, and we see them around all kinds of stars. But this might not sound so weird, but if you think about our solar system, it, it's kind of weird. In our solar system, we have three kinds of planets. We have sort of small, rocky Earth-like planets. We have giant Jupiter-sized planets. And then we have pretty giant ice planets. But we don't have anything in between. When we go to exoplanets, so as shown now is on the x-axis, this is the, the size uh, of planets that we're seeing, and on the y-axis, how many we have seen. You see that the, the biggest bars uh, are for planets that are in between. So planets that are bigger than Earth, but quite a bit smaller than Neptune, one of the ice giants. So the most common planets, it seems like, in our galaxy are planets that we do not have in the solar system. So if I were to sum up where we stand on exoplanet research, it is that planets are very exoplanets are very common. So we are not special in the sense that we're having planets in our solar system. Uh, but, planet, but our solar, we haven't found any system that looks like our solar system yet. And the most common planets are things that do not exist in our solar system. Now, whether this is one of, you know, cosmic coincidence, or whether there's something about our solar system that made it easier for um, life and for complex life uh, to, to develop, um, is something we don't know yet. But there is uh, one thing about the solar system. <coughs> which we think was very important for, for life to develop. And notice that the Earth is sitting at a distance from the star uh, where you could have liquid water. So when we look at all of these thousands of exoplanets, there's a subset of around 10 or so <coughs> that, the, um, excuse me, that are extra exciting because they also reside at a bright distance from their star at the so-called habitable zone where they could potentially sustain water. So when astronomers think about the habitability of planets, they're pretty simple-minded. They basically have two criteria. Uh, one is that the planet is rocky, so small. Um, reason for that is that most chemists who think about organs of life, they like having a surface to have chemistry happening on. And the second one is that you have liquid water. Now, this, where this sort of habitable zone falls will depend on what kind of star you have. So if you have a big star, then you're going to have to go further away to be at the right temperature for water to be liquid. If you have a small star, you're going to have to be further in. And the, the habitable zone plants that are the most easiest to detect are the ones around the small stars. Uh, this sort of transit detections, they become, become more likely if you are sitting close to your star. So small stars have to solve closer to their star, makes them easier to detect. One of the most famous systems of sort of have to zone planets that was in the news about two years ago, a year, year and a half ago, is the Trappist-1 system, uh, which you might have seen. This one has seven little planets that are sitting sort of on a string in, in, around a very small star. Uh, three of which are sitting at the right distance to be able to sustain uh, liquid water. Now, at least one of you should be thinking, so what's this obsession with liquid water? Uh, isn't that a bit Earth-centric? Just because we, we need water, does that mean all life needs water? Uh, I mean, in some sense it is. So you could conceive of uh, life that does not need water, maybe of life that's not based on chemistry at all. Uh, but water, um, you, you, to have a, chem a complex chemistry happening, uh, you do need some medium in which that chemistry happens. Water is a really excellent solvent to have, to have, a, lot of, like, to have a diverse chemistry happening. And water also, we think, uh, is the most abundant solvent that we find in the universe. So we'll come back to that. So 
those two things together has led to astronomers as they're focusing on water uh, as a criteria for looking, uh, looking for uh, life. Now, if we go back, uh, I said that there were about 10 of these planets that we had found. So that might sound like these planets are really rare. When we're thinking about that there are on the order of 100 billion stars uh, in the galaxy. But with the current uh, telescopes and instrumentation that astronomers have, these planets are really difficult to find. And actually, uh, even though there is some disagreement how common they are, uh, we think these planets are really common based on just a few detections we have. Uh, you will get some different figures from different people, but somewhere between 1 and 10% of stars in the galaxy uh, are uh, have one of these rocky planets uh, in their habitable zone. So, even if we take the lower, so it's about 1%, that means around a billion of them in the galaxy, so that, that's a lot. Okay, so we have, there are lots of exoplan exoplanets that are extremely common. Planets that could have liquid water are very common. Um, but do they actually have liquid water? I mean, just because you're sitting at the right temperature doesn't mean that you necessarily have the water that you base the criteria on. So this is one artist's impression of one of the trappedest planets. But it could just as well be a desert that just happens to sit at room temperature. I mean, that is uh, perfectly possible if you have no other data. But we do have other data. Even if you just look at the solar system, uh, we can get some really important clues uh, of why this artist's impression is actually probably correct. This is a, a shows the different bodies in the solar system where we know there is water, uh, and the, the blue sphere shows just how much water it has. Uh, it doesn't include the giant planets, which also have water, things like Jupiter, Neptune, they all have a lot of water, but just the smaller bodies. Uh, the only point I want to make with this is that water is very common in the solar system. It is not something, Earth is not, it's not special because it has water. It actually has quite a little water, like not that much water for its size compared to many of the moons, for example, that you see in the, in the outer solar system. The, the only way we can explain this is uh, that these planets formed in an environment that was rich in water. So, was this environment special to how the solar system formed, or do planets generally form with a lot of water? Well, to answer that, I need to give you sort of one minute crash course in how stars and planets form. It is going to involve the word protoplanetary disk, but it's actually a really nice Aristotelian term which points to the final cause of, the, of the, these disks. So, it's a good word, even though it has many parts to it. So, stars and uh, planets form. Uh, out of the dust and gas that exist between stars. This is one famous picture that's showing uh, just that. It's called the Pillars of Creation, which may or may not be, be helpful when we're trying to think about science and, and geology together. Um, it looks sort of like a hand, which is why I think it, it has, has been given that name. But what it is, is that these are basic clouds the clouds of material, clouds of dust and gas. Uh, when this uh, dust and gas uh, gets dense enough, which is still very, very low density compared to anything here, uh, but if it gets dense enough, it will start to collapse in on itself. And that is the first step towards forming, forming a star. So I'm going to basically walk, uh, walk with you backwards from what we see in the solar system to that cloud and, how, and try to tie in how that um, tells us that there's likely water everywhere. So what we have here first is the solar system. So this is where we're currently living. This is where we see all this water in moons, moons and planets and all. Uh, these planets and moons, they all form from gas and dust that was around our star during its first 10 million years. This dust around the young sun uh, came with it as a part of its formation. 
So when the sun was even younger, it was enveloped in a much bigger cloud of dust and gas, which was feeding on, being pulled into the gravitational potential uh, of the sun. But some of that material got left uh, around the sun, and it did to preserve angular momentum. If you were to put all the angular momentum that was initially in the cloud of dust and gas that I showed in the previous slide into the sun, you would tear it apart. So the way that nature solves this is by putting some of the material in a nice little disk uh, around, around the star, around the sun. And this is where all the planets have uh, come from. Now, this material that was around the young sun originally came from the collapse of the kind of clouds that I showed you on the previous slide. And in these clouds, we see that there's tons of water. So we know that these clouds, these interstellar clouds, are full of water. Uh, so then the question is, did all that water that was there when planets were forming in the solar system, was, did it come all the way from the cloud? If it did, we, it should have done any planetary system that forms will form with a lot of water. There's no reason to think that it will be preserved in our case and not in ours. On the other hand, if the water forms like in the disk, it might have been special to us. So that's a scientific question we can, we can answer. And the way that we answer that uh, is by looking, actually looking back again at the solar system and looking at the water in the solar system. And when we look very carefully at the water in the solar system, we see that there's too much heavy water. There's too much water around that has a deuterium atom in it instead of a normal uh, hydrogen atom. The only way we know to enrich the water to the degree we see it is by having it forming really, really cold in one of those clouds that I just showed you. So the water that we have here in the solar system, at least a large fraction of it, is older than the sun. It came as a part of the sun forming, and it's going to come in general as a part of other stars and planets forming. So based on that, uh, what we can say is that planets, there are many, many planets that are sitting at the right temperature to have, to have liquid water. Most of them probably do have access to liquid water. Uh, water is, seems like it's going to be extremely common during planet formation. So in the final criteria, so very basic criteria to have a living planet, is to have an interest in chemistry on this. The way that we think about the origins of life is that you have basically physics making a planet, then you have some chemistry that becomes more and more complex, that it somehow acquires, it builds up the functions that we associate with living systems, and when it has the functions of a living system, it is a living system. And that's something that can be argued, just what, what is life is a, is a partially separate uh, conversation that they have no expertise in, but if you ask questions, you should, because they'll ask questions about it, and that will direct you to someone in the audience they has. But thinking about the very first steps, we need an interest in chemistry. And the chemistry that has uh, gotten a lot of attention uh, lately uh, is one involving hydrogen cyanide. Cyanide not so good for, for the living things, but as it turns out, pretty good for creating interest in chemistry before there, there is life. Uh, so this is a, just a cartoon showing all the interesting molecules you can make as long as you have HGM and UV light around, including all the building blocks of things like RNA or, or proteins. So we can also ask, how often do you get uh, hydrogen cyanide uh, when you're forming a planet? So to go back to our cartoon, so where we, we want to see if we have hydrogen cyanide are in these protoplanetary disks, the disks that are going to lead to planets, hence protoplanetary disks. Um, and see, uh, is there commonly hydrogen cyanide there? Uh, we have a beautiful new telescope done in Chile called ALMA, which we can use to, to explore this. When we turn ALMA towards these disks, First of all, we see them. So these are uh, astrophysical observations, astronomical observations of some of these disks, these planet-forming disks. You can actually see what's probably planets carving out these dark lanes. So they're sort of forming from these material in the disks. 
if you look at light that is coming only from hydrogen cyanide, so you spectroscopy to isolate that light, we do indeed see that they do have hydrogen cyanide, and they have quite a bit. So, final sort of scientific summary. Um, not only are these habitable planets common, not only do they commonly have access to water, we think they also commonly have access to the kind of organics that uh, here on Earth probably was the first step towards life. So, this, this seems to put us in a, in a pretty good position to say something about how likely it is to have extraterrestrial life. But there is a big caveat, which is that what I have just told you is some sort of minimum conditions for getting started towards the path towards life. So this is one of several cartoons that shows that you have a planet, you have chemistry, you get some more complex chemistry, you develop the structures that we associate with life, and then here on Earth, 3.6 billion years ago, you get life. The problem is that most of this part of this cartoon uh, is unknown, how you go from one uh, to the other. Uh, we know how to get up to things like the building blocks of RNA, so small parts uh, of RNA. We do not know how to go from there to a living system, or something that is close to having the functionality of a living system. This is a very this is an active area of scientific research. I am part of it. I am hoping we're going to figure this out. But this is not something that we know how this happened to occur. And therefore, it becomes very, I would say, impossible to predict uh, how often it is going to happen elsewhere. Uh, you off, I mean, I just, um, for a class I was teaching, I read Dawkins' The God Delusion, uh, which was you know, interesting experience on its own. But one of the things he says, you know, he says, now let's be conservative. Let's say that life has a one in a billion chance uh, of developing. This still means that there's going to be a hundred other places in a galaxy where you get it. But what if it's one in a hundred billion? Or one in a billion billion? Or one in ten? Like we really do not know uh, where on that, uh, which ones of those probabilities that is the realistic one. Uh, the way that we're going to try to get at this is by looking for life elsewhere. So there are astronomical missions that are uh, in the process of being built, or that are currently uh, that have launched, are currently uh, starting their mission. That are there to look at the atmospheres uh, of planets. This is the James Webb Telescope, which was supposed to be launched this year, but. They had a small issue with the giant sun shield uh, ripping, which hopefully they will fix and then launch next year. Uh, but this is uh, sort of the replacement of the Hubble Space Telescope. And one of its main missions is to look at the atmospheres uh, of exoplanets. And what we will be looking for are the signatures of molecules. So this shows what the atmospheres would look like um, for Earth and, and, and Mars and, and Venus, uh, what the atmosphere, the, the, we'll be looking for molecules in these atmospheres that are difficult to explain without life, is the most conservative way to put it. So things like oxygen, ozone, methane. Uh, it's going to take another couple of decades before we have anything conclusive uh, around Earth like planets. With this telescope, we'll get spectra like this towards a handful of planets at most. And if the chances is lower than 1 in 10, that's not going to be conclusive for saying if there's life on Earth. I do want to make a quick uh, the, yes, uh, push for that you don't have to leave the solar system for potentially finding extraterrestrial life. Uh, we have at least one person in the audience who is very committed to, to looking at uh, some of the moons in the outer solar system, some of those moons where I said there was lots of, lots of water. Uh, I am also a big fan of uh, one particular moon, which is Enceladus, a small moon uh, around Saturn, which very helpfully spews out some of its water into space. So what you can see here is basically is the, is the giant water plume. 
So if there is life uh, in this motion, uh, there's actually the possibility that you can see signs of it by going to Enceladus and sampling this blue. <coughs> so this is, uh, I mean, this can happen in the next 10 to 20 years, that we find signs of life in exoplanets, signs of life in the solar system. <coughs> So, wait, what does that? Um, <coughs> so, what does that tell us about the place of humanity in the universe? Well, space can seem extremely large. Or it is very large because it is very large, and there is in one sense in which putting a planet around every star. Seems to have made our system uh, less significant, less special. Um, this has sometimes has been used as an argument against uh, theism, and um, that how can we think that we have this special relationship with God when we are so insignificant compared to the universe? Um, if the atheists thought they were first with having this existential issue. Um, they, they would be wrong. I mean, the, the psalmist, Psalm 8, had a very, I think, similar thought when he said, when I see your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars that you set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? This, uh, it doesn't seem to me that just because you made it a bit bigger, you have actually fundamentally sometimes changed this existential crisis. On the contrary, I would claim that by having each of these stars be a word of their own, we have in some way made the universe a bit cozier. It is far easier, I think, to feel empathy with a star that is a planetary system, maybe even more so if it is a living system. But of course, we don't know whether these uh, planetary systems are living systems. As I already mentioned, we don't know what the probability is for having extraterrestrial life. And therefore, whether we inhabit a universe that's teeming with life, uh, which, I mean, I hope we do, and it seems like, that, to me, it seems like it would be the most fitting, but I also don't want to second guess the, the mind of God, except Paul Father Thomas in, in that, but I hope there is. Uh, that, that shows you know, his creative power uh, in ways that we cannot imagine here on Earth. But there's also a certain beauty in the thought of us as the you know, lonely ark as sailing through the universe in time and space, carrying the whole treasure of life in it. And uh, I don't think that, I, that icon would also not in, in my mind uh, in any way risk our relationship with God. So the final thing I want to touch upon is uh, when you think about God's special relationship with man. It's not with create, our creative as a whole, but with, with man. <coughs> uh, said there, the two anxieties that tend to come up are whether it really makes sense to think about our relationship, like our, that we are special in the way that um, both church teaching and scripture, I think, strongly indicates. Uh, if there are other ones uh, like us out there, and then whether there are direct teachings and pas passages in scripture that would preclude intelligent life that is not human. I mean, I think there's certain that is one kind of intelligent life that is not precluded, because we already know of them, and that would be angels. So clearly, that's sort of second, like other uh, created intelligent being, uh, in no way uh, threatens our specialness or uh, obviously the teachings. But this is not exactly the same as when we're thinking about other rational, uh, rational animals. And the, I think the real conflict that comes up when we're thinking about other rational animals is that we have two options, either they're fallen or they're not fallen. If they are not, if they are fallen, we would assume they would need to be that God would want to redeem them. And even if they are not fallen, 
it seems a bit unfair that we had this really special relationship with God through the incarnation, if, and they would not. So one of the questions that have come up is, is another incarnation possible? Uh, when I raised this uh, a year ago, I said this is something would be nice to you know, look into. Uh, Steve, uh, Steve Barr uh, kindly pointed me to you that Thomas had already done so. Uh, so this is uh, one of the quotes from the, from the Summa that he treats. Uh, Basically, what kind of, like, when would it, um, into, to which creature would it be fitting to, for God to become incarnate to? And explains why rational animals is the only kind where it would be fitting. And then he goes on to talk about is it possible to have more than one incarnation in, uh, in a rational animal? And he's obviously thinking about only humans. And Thomas says emphatically yes. Uh, it's not like having one incarnation limited God's power uh, in any, uh, any way or sense. Um, but of course, because it's possible doesn't mean that it's done. And as I said, there are some concerns that there are passages in scripture that seems to be pretty clear about it only happening once. But they might not be as clear as you think. And I highly recommend uh, this book by Marie George on um, Christianity and Extraterrestrials, uh, which really takes her starting point in St. Thomas, and as well as her own uh, reading of scripture guided by, by the church, and goes through, I think, all the problems that have been raised with the possibility of extraterrestrial intelligences. So those problems aside, I mean, I, I, her conclusions, I guess I'm going to give away is that she thinks it's possible but improbable that there are extraterrestrial intelligent life, but it's only possible under conditions that they are either unfallen or fallen and redeemed by Jesus Christ. So you can have another incarnation, but you can't have another incarnation that leads to redemption. So that seems to be pretty clear that that was a once and for all by kind of event. Um, but I think there's also some of the great possibilities and excitement that would come uh, with an encounter with an extraterrestrial uh, intelligent being. And I think the, what I think would be the most exciting is that it would give an opportunity to do in some sense true comparative theology, where you would have a really a completely different view of how God could God is. I think it's all something that's very likely to teach us something fundamentally new about ourselves. I think just looking historically, uh, if you look at when some of the sort of big developments in understanding what, um, what humans are, what their rights are, has often happened and encountered with new cultures that did not seem to express humanity the way we used to. We think about the development of human rights. Uh, there's a Dominican that was heavily involved in that, which I noted. So uh, Francisco de Vittorio, uh, who in the encounter, in Spain's encounter, uh, with the new word, and many of the temptations to treat the humans they run into as less than human, uh, to that as a starting point to develop uh, our, our teaching about human rights. And I think it's very likely that running into rational animals that are some, in, very different from us and yet are the same fundamental species in terms of being a rational animal will teach us something new and exciting and important what it, what it means to be a rational animal that's a special creation of, of God. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Slight change in our procedure, just so that we uh, encourage questions from all the different um, sorts of people that we have attending this conference. I'm just going to moderate and try and encourage perhaps some of the students, some of the grad students, to lead off our discussion here and then mix it up as we go. Yes, in back. How, how natural is this? Uh, like the, the, the development of, of, of uh, yeah, do, 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 do we understand it all? 
how natural it is for, for life to, to complexify enough to, to develop it into um, intelligent life. Like, so, so you, you know, provided, provided like the, the right initial conditions to produce intelligent life, like is, is that a, you know, is that a natural process that, that, that will always occur? Or is that like, uh, you know, is that, is that like miraculous in some way? Uh, so I think there's uh, two parts of that question. So, so one is uh, so what do we understand of natural process in going from, say, the uh, last common, like, common ancestor or what you can think about the simplest possible life, or even from the later single cell life that developed on Earth, uh, to things like um, Things like uh, apes, basically, like what we're thinking about is very, uh, very advanced um, organisms that have a pretty big brain. And I would say no. There, there's a there's a big gap in understanding um, why that sort of leap uh, happened. I mean, people have ideas, and there are, you know, parts of it that where the models work, but it's not a solved problem. Uh, why that happened? And why it happened when it happened, and or whether it will, will always happen. But I would say that then we go from the very um, advanced uh, animal life uh, to a rational, uh, a rational animal such as ourselves. That that is not. I think cannot in principle be a purely natural process, even though it's tied to the sort of natural development of a bigger brain uh, and the like. And why can't I'm going to leave to one of the philosophers, Thomists, uh, to answer if they have a step in. I'll make a slide to yeah. you. Okay, go ahead, sorry. Um, uh, just a quick comment before my question is like, you remind me of um, Justin Martyr, your, your upbeat spirit in, in um, exploring these questions reminds me of Justin Martyr's line, whatever is true and good is ours, you need to say, if it's objectively true and good, it's compatible. So, mm -hmm. Um, but the question is like, there are many speculations now that if we have the same pressures of evolution, then in certain life forms would have evolved similar features, radial symmetries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, um, do you think um, they would, we can consider, even though there's no biological lineage to be of the same kind? Now he comes this question, but you don't have to jump to that. But more just a speculative question at the same time. Um, um, what what could be the prospects for like um, even same pressures? Um, um, do you think um, these life forms we can also consider, if they're rational could be considered like um, um, having those same dignities? Uh, I, yeah. I know these are very big questions. Yeah, no, I think they're good questions. In some sense, I am. Absolutely not equipped to, to answer that, but I give some and I say count on the gentle correction of, of other people that have heard of. So, yeah, I think if they are rational animals, I mean, that means they are supernaturally and soul. I would say they do have the same dignity as, as we would assign to, to, to one, one of us. Killing them would be an atrocity. Um, I also, to go to your sort of more speculations on would evolutionary pressure be to some similar features? My guess would be that some, yes. I mean, we have seen, for example, eyes develop several times uh, on Earth. So it seems like some way to take in information through electro, that is an electromagnetic radiation. Uh, it seems like evolutionary pressure would push uh, towards that. Um, some way to interact efficiently with the material world seems like that would be reasonable. Uh, so some sort of limbs that makes it easy to interact and build things. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would I would think so. Uh, beyond that, I say um, I respect my biology colleagues too much to to speculate uh, too much further than that. Thank you. Okay. 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 So you were talking about our galaxy. What does that mean? Yes. For like planets in our galaxy. How far away is the field from ever looking at other galaxies? And yeah. asking that same question. Yeah, no, so that's, a, that's a great question. So currently, there's sort of several different uh, steps. So if you want to look at uh, atmospheres 
uh, on sort of habitable zone planets, we can't even go very far within our galaxy. We really have to stay in the sort of our local local neighborhood, which is why it's so exciting that um, this Trappist system is not very far away. Our closest star, Proxima, uh, Proxima B, has, has a companion. So that way, it seems that we can stay local and still make category. Uh, to detect large number of planets, we're currently <coughs> limited uh, to our galaxy, but I would say we'd, we'll be able to get some statistics on the other galaxies in our local group, so Andromeda being the biggest ones. Um, that is not uh, at all beyond what is technically doable, uh, even, even now, even though it becomes um, more and more challenging. Moving beyond that, it's, it's going to be hard because it becomes difficult to distinguish individual stars when you move to galaxies that are much further away, especially individual smaller stars, <coughs> which is where most of the planets are. Yeah, Mr. Tony, from his hand up the beginning. When you showed the map of the probabilities of exoplanets of different sizes, yeah. how much selection bias are you running into with what we're capable of observing? Because there's very few small planets, and I suspect that they're hard to see. Uh, so that's that's right. So the, there are two different selection biases that come in. Um, one, uh, the most severe one, is that we can't really see planets that are beyond the orbit of Mars. Uh, they just take too long, and the missions that have been there are not really been looking for planets uh, in a statistical way that are further. So, so that, that's a big one, which means that we can't. Uh, if there, if, and in our solar system, you get very different planets if you look at different places. And that might be true um, in general, even though it might be just follow what we see in the solar system. The other bias is indeed that it becomes the smaller planet class gives a, a smaller fit. And where the, that bias starts to really set in is um, around the size of Earth. So when we look at things that are slightly bigger, we can see them almost as easy as Jupiter size with, uh, with this one mission where we have most statistics. But around one, um, the size of Earth and smaller, it gets considerably harder. Uh, so what we can say is that it seems like these intermediate planets are more common, like Earth, like planets. We don't think that the bias could change uh, that statement. But we are definitely missing many more of that, those Earth-sized planets than the slightly larger ones. And, and that, that has to be modeled, so it's, those biases are very big, pretty much. A slight follow-up question. Yeah. We're looking at the habitable zone planets. Why are we looking at Enceladus? And does that change what we actually mean by the habitable zone? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So, um, I said uh, astronomers have focused on the habitable zone as the, as the zone where you have liquid water on the surface. Uh, I said liquid water, kind of softly, but really what we mean is, is liquid water uh, on the surface. Uh, but in the solar system, we know we have liquid water much further out, these moons around uh, giant planets. And that's something that you could have in other systems as well, you very likely have it. The, the main reason we don't focus on those is that there's no way we could detect life on those. So, but in the solar system, there are ways, which is why it's, it's very worth exploring in the solar system without really changing our focus, I think, in exoplanet group uh, science. Um, you briefly mentioned that um, the process of how we get from like the building blocks to RNA to a single cell organism is unclear, and that obviously influences the probability that we'll find life somewhere else. But do you take uh, the fact that that process is not yet known to us, and the fact that we haven't been able to replicate that as evidence of the probability of that happening naturally or randomly is very, very slim? Is that an appropriate introduction to me? No, I don't think so. Like, I don't think we are even close to being able to make that conclusion. Um, on the contrary, I would say, I mean, <coughs> It means what time scales we're talking about, so what we, we need to bring in. Uh, if, it's, if you look at the, at the Earth's history, just looking at whether this was difficult or not. Uh, so, from most accounts, the Earth was just not how the world, if we go further back than 3.9 billion years. 
there was too much bombardment going on, too many sort of like crossing all the events. Uh, you might be able to push a little bit further, but you, you run four billion, you hit a point where you, you're not going to go earlier than that. Um, the earliest um, signs of life that we have that is more or less accepted in the community is around 3.5 billion years ago. That means that within a small fraction of the lifetime of Earth, so 500 million years, and the Earth will probably persist for up towards uh, 10, million, 10 billion years, uh, life happened. Uh, that would suggest that on the time scales that you have available to you, uh, sort of the cosmological time scales, uh, it's not that difficult for life to um, So that, that's sort of the, the optimistic one. Uh, then the I guess the, the more pessimistic one is that uh, very smart scientists have been trying, as you alluded to, for, for quite some time to, to make headway uh, towards uh, in chemical, syst uh, chemical systems that do display with, uh, the kind of functionality that we expect living systems to do. And we have made, made some headway, but they have not gotten very far. And uh, it's um, it's unclear whether the paths that have kind of particle collaborations are doing this, that like they're doing some really like cool uh, cool things. And I mean, they are solving some parts of the puzzle for sure. Uh, but whether it's just that we need to continue to like this and sort of piece by piece put the puzzle together, or whether we're missing something fundamental, I think we're we're not there yet. Whether we can uh, where we can make that decision. Yeah, I, we can we can add uh, faculty to the to the <laughs> mix after having. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> Steve, do you want to ask a question and maybe come back to this gentleman? Um, so to say, uh, five hundred, three hundred million years to have living things. In it. Is it possible there's a selection bias there? Because of course we're on a planet where we appear, and to, to observe that. And in order to have us there, but suppose there were five serious evolutionary hurdles, maybe forming the first living thing, maybe multicellular life, maybe complex nervous systems, whatever. And you have to fit all those in before the sun burns out. And that may have forced a sort of an accelerated uh, development of the first living thing. Is that possible? Maybe. So just, just looking at historically what's happened on Earth. So it basically took us around, at the most, half a billion years, probably, to get to awareness of life. But then it took a few billion years to go from there to get um, on a path towards mammals and like more multicellular life. But once you get started on that, it was really just another half a billion year before we appeared. So it seems like a bottle, like if there's a, so from a time scale point of view, it seems like a bottleneck is going from single cell to, to, to multi-cell and not the origin or to go for sort of multi-cell to uh, more, more, more complex organisms such as, such, such as mammals. So, uh, but I'm saying that as you know, not the biologist. So I, I don't really want to, to push that further beyond just saying that those, those are the observed, uh, observed time scales. Why don't we go to this gentleman here and then over to the other um, I wonder what you think about like uh, Fermi paradox type arguments where it's like once rational rational intelligent life develops takes only a few thousand years for them to be able to communicate and even like traverse the galaxy but we haven't found any evidence of that so probably of uh, any like exoprosis life at least in proximity to us is very low like rational yeah there's a contemporary incarnation of, of that argument which goes as the following so it's based on the, basically what you said but um, looking at us as, as the model system uh, we seem to always want to expand what we're doing. And to do that, we need more energy. What is the main source of energy uh, if you're sitting on a planet? It's the star. So you try to get all the energy you can from the star. What is the best way, like the maximum energy you can get from the star? It's by building a sphere, basically, of solar panels around the star, so-called Dyson sphere, uh, to get all the energy you can and once you run out of energy there, you go to the next star, because if you can get all the energy from the star, you can probably also travel through space. And then you have the same kind of argument to say that within sort of 100 million years, a civilization should be able to settle a galaxy, 
and therefore we should see galaxies um, where the stars are dimmed in this sort of weird way by right. these nice stars. And we don't. <laughs> uh, so therefore, there's no, uh, no alien life. I would like to tell you that it's not alien life. Uh, I mean, I don't, I guess I don't find them too compelling because they do assume quite a lot about the psychology and civilizational structure about aliens. <laughs> and I'm not the only one that they would like ourselves. Uh, so, so I think that's where sort of the weak uh, point of those are. In addition, they do make assumptions about how physics and technology will develop, which for speculations, maybe they're, they're possible, but far from certain, uh, I think. But I think that maybe the sociology and the psychology are the, are the weakest points in those arguments. So I don't think they're conclusive. So, um, on the slide you showed with uh, the percentage of water, you know that the Earth has a very, very small percentage, like drastically so compared to the other one. Is there any, obviously there's no direct detection of how much water is on the exoplanet. Do you have any sense of explanation for why the Earth is an anomaly in that way? Yeah, so, so those are two questions in one, so I'll, I'll take them apart. So actually, do you have water detections in some exoplanets, uh, but not in small rocky ones? So these would be more Jupiter-sized planets. So it, it does indeed uh, exist there. Uh, so, the, so the Earth, um, so there is sort of one, it's both a mystery and not. And the part that it's not is that if you look where the planets form around the sun, um, the planets that form close to the star, they form um, where the water that was around was all in the gas space. So if you ever low pressure, which you have in these disks, uh, water is either ice or gas, there's no liquid. Uh, and it was too warm to be ice, so it was all in the gas. And that means that the planets, when they form from the solids in this disk, they form with very little water. Uh, while if you go a bit further out, let's say outside the asteroid belt, where Jupiter, Saturn, and all their moons uh, are, they form where water was uh, frozen out of these solid particles, and therefore they form with a lot of water. So that's sort of the zero order explanation. But now the Earth maybe has um, both less and more water than it should have. Uh, so we think we lost probably a lot of the initial water that we had uh, by a very big impact that caused the moon uh, to form. But then we got some of it back through impacts with as wet asteroids and comet like ones. So there's sort of Multi-tron, but the, the basic one is that we form too close to the star to have ice on the solids that we form. If I can take the privilege of asking a question, <laughs> so to bring us back a little bit to the philosophical questions um, that we started with, in thinking back to Dr. Carroll's presentation, and you were talking about the origins of life and the, the research that you've been involved in uh, with respect to this. So that's a very interesting question to me, and I don't know enough about the science, and also maybe not enough about the philosophy, um, to really feel like I've gotten to the bottom of it. Maybe nobody has really gotten to the bottom of it. But, but Aquinas and Aristotle, I think based on observation, thought that it was possible for life to come from inanimate matter, uh, so just low levels of life. Um, and now, by observation, we would say, well, we don't see that happening. Um, but they didn't think that that was a philosophical problem for their understanding. Uh, we have, in a way, the opposite uh, problem. Now, you just made a reference to um, it being easier to get from inanimate to single-celled organisms, in a certain sense, than from single-celled organisms to multi-celled organisms. Could you speak about what is your understanding of what's what's necessary to go from inanimate to animate and is there something do you think it's important to say that there's a qualitative change there sufficiently qualitatively different that we would want to talk about a substantial change or some new principle that needs to be uh, part of the picture yeah the, the very short answer is that I don't know so, but the slightly longer answer uh, is, um, I mean, the way that the scientific, the 
scientists that I work with operate is that there is a sort of smooth transition between the the most complex chemical system you could uh, envision that would have, say, most of the functionalities of the living system, but maybe miss some 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 part, uh, and a truly living system. Um, I think there's a useful way of thinking about it when you're trying to figure out what chemistry could lead up to, to that point. Um, I am less certain whether that is a rigorous philosophical way uh, to think about it. So, so I think it's, it's useful when we're, you're just trying to get up to the point of sort of getting all the functionalities that you, you would associate with the living system. Uh, I just when you're talking to someone who took the same course, I think that Father Thomas took in philosophy, but never then became a Dominican and went back to school to do actual like philosophy. I also remember the Descartes as a yeah. Um, so as I actually I, I, I just don't know. Like I said, the way we operate is that you don't, but that doesn't mean that it is the proper, most accurate way to think about it. I've been working with uh, biologists and chemists in, in the Catholic University of Chile on a big project on what kind of question is the question, what is the origin of life? Uh, I mean, so is, it a, is it a biological question? Well, in a sense, no, because for, bio, for biology, you will already need life. Well, is it a question in chemistry? Well, not exactly either. So what kind of, and, and of course, that has to be distinguished from the question of whether or not one can point to uh, natural causes, you know, secondary causes, without some special divine intervention. And that's a, a, a separate issue. But it seems to me that there is the, there's no, the first thing is, well, if you're going to ask the question, what is the origin of life in what discipline or interdisciplinary intersection do you look for answers to that kind of question? And I'm not sure, uh, at least my colleagues in South America in the sciences, they're not sure when pressed on that point as to when, where we must seek the answer or what, indeed in what disciplines we must seek the answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I have any sort of principle or like uh, answer to that. All I can say is that the collaboration that I'm involved in, which I think has been a very functional one, um, is I think by, by nature an interdisciplinary one, where you combine chemist, biologists, and geologists, and, and astronomers, and, and the like. So I think it is, it is not, even from a practical point of view, it is not obvious um, how to approach it, where to go from sort of biology and try to go back as far as you can, or where to work your way up from from chemistry and what does, yeah, I, I have no real insight beyond that. There might be some, when Pope John Paul II in the mid-1990s talked about evolution being more than simply a hypothesis and so forth, he said, he made, he made a distinction between the fact that we affirm a kind of biological continuity among living things, but we must also affirm an ontological discontinuity between human life and animal life, where at the, but yet at the same time affirming biological continuity. And maybe something similar is here too with respect to the origin of life a kind of continuity with respect to natural, <coughs> natural causes, but at the same time, an ontological discontinuity between the inanimate and the animate. And uh, so therefore, we would need both the continuity question of the natural sciences, but we'd also need some insight to, to understand a real ontological discontinuity, unless, of course, we don't recognize a difference between the animate and the inanimate in the first place. Yeah, I think I, I agree. I think we have time for just one more question. Still on the box, we have a bit more uh, So, 
there's, there's this book by, by Caleb Sharp, who's a master biologist from Columbia University. He's the director of the department there. And this book is called The Copernicus Complex. And he, he points out a series of things, like one of the things that he says in this, in this book about the search for life in any plant is the problem of orbits. That the orbits, you know, in a very large time scale change, even the orbit of the Earth, and that creates an even bigger problem because it, we need not just to look in space, but also in time. Because maybe some of the plants would have been in the habitable zone previously and now they're not, or they're going to move there. And, 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 and but he also points to other things. But what I, what I was surprised, I didn't read the full book, but what I was surprised by some of the things that he says, and it's part of in the title, he says that through the history of science all, after Copernicus, he kind of, he, he says that we've kind of become more um, optimistic about, more and more optimistic about finding life outside of Europe. But in the previous, in the, in the past recent decades, seems like the 70s or the 80s, as the more we look, it seems that after all, you know, the Earth might be much more special than actually we thought it was. So he was actually surprisingly, he had kind of a negative look at, at that, and whereas you have just a very positive one, and I was very surprised by that too. Yeah, I mean, I think that depends a bit on how such as agnostic you are, what is needed for, like what's the minimum requirements you can think of for Earth-like life to originate. As what I have given is really sort of minimum, uh, minimum requirements, you know, water, organics, time. And, uh, but, but I think one of the things that we have come to realize is that plants can communicate. And, it, and I think a system like the Trappist lung system where you have seven planets, they have definitely moved in and out of the habitable zone. Like the planets who are currently in the habitable zone were not uh, like a couple of billion years ago. But they're also close enough that they're going to have rocks going back and forth between these planets. So it's kind of enough that you are in the habitable zone for long enough. Long enough. It seemed like for Earth, it was maybe a couple of billion years. Uh, however, uh, relevant that is for other planets. So I'm not that concerned about those, as long as it's not super short uh, time scales. I mean, maybe all it took on Earth was 100 million years. I mean, we, we just don't know, all because it was less than, than half a billion years. Uh, so I don't think that is, is that disconcerting. Um, and as I said, we are seeing quite a lot of these, these planets. Uh, the percentage so is on the, the 1% for possible, and uh, even if it is much lower than that, like 0.01%, I mean, now I'm playing the same game as stockings, right, which makes me a little bit uncomfortable with that. <laughs> uh, there's, still, there's a lot of stars in, in the galaxy, so you can make these uh, constraints more strict uh, without running into much trouble, and uh, I think um, I think it's much too early to make them much stricter than I did. We just don't understand uh, what what is needed or for for life to have a chance to to come into being. And uh, until we do that, I don't think there's any reason to to add further restrictions. Because it's my very practical uh, approach. Let's thank Dr. Uber.